I think communicating with each pitcher in terms of what his vision for his personal process is, and then communicating, you know, your vision and then kind of meshing the two together, um, I think is important because the player needs to have ownership and belief in what he's doing. I think that's really important. What's up and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for being here. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Baseball Cloud's revolutionary software platform brings to life the numbers captured by TrackMan and FlightScope. This provides colleges, players, and facility owners around the world a turnkey product allowing them to analyze their data using key metrics and custom visualizations on one intuitive user interface. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. On today's show, we welcome the pitching coach for the University of North Carolina, Robert Woodard. Robert returned to his alma mater as an assistant coach in 2016. The all-time winningest pitcher in program history, Woodard posted a career record of 34-5 over four seasons as a Tar Heel. A native of Charlotte, Woodard was a three-time All-ACC performer and the 2006-2007 recipient of the Patterson Medal, Carolina's highest athletic honor. Following his professional playing career in the San Diego Padres system, Woodard spent the 2011 and 2012 seasons as an assistant at UNC before serving as the pitching coach at UNCW in 2013 and at Virginia Tech from 2014 through 2016. And on the show, we discuss how they develop arms at UNC, what he looks for on the recruiting trail, and we talk about how they use pauses in their delivery to mess with hitters' timing. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode is so good, and here is Robert Woodard. Coach Woodard, welcome to Ahead of the Curve. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you having me on. Definitely. And, you know, I've been a fan of yours uh, from afar for a long period of time, and so I couldn't tell you how excited I am to get you on the mic and to uh, dig into some player development with you today. But if we have any listeners out there who may not be completely familiar with you, can you just share a little bit about your baseball background and why you decided to get into coaching? Sure. Yeah. Well, first, I just I've certainly listen to the podcast a good amount, and um, you've had some fantastic um, just baseball minds and, and coaches on prior to me. So it's an honor to to be on here with you. In terms of kind of my, my background and upbringing, just from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, um, probably my probably the mentor that sparked the most uh, enthusiasm for the game for me was a guy named Mike Schilt, who's now the St. Louis Cardinals manager. Um, he was my travel coach for the On Deck O's in Charlotte, North Carolina for four years. Uh, he recruited myself and about 20 other eighth and ninth graders to join his startup facility there. And for four years, I was really a training ground for us to learn the game, um, how it's meant to be played and approached and practiced and played and thought about. So that was kind of for four years, I had a major league manager sort of teaching me the game. And it's no surprise to me that he's, he's climbed the ranks to, to where he is today. He's a special human. So from there I went and I, I, was, I got to play at my parents' alma mater in Chapel Hill here at UNC, smallest scholarship offer of any school that I was offered from, um, but it's where I always wanted to play. I got to get to play for Coach Fox, who's obviously a great mentor of mine and for four years. And then I had two pitching coaches, Roger Williams, who's now the pitching coach at Louisville, and Scott Forbes, who I now coach with, who's my pitching coach for two years, two other great mentors of mine in the four years I was here. At UNC. From there, I was a senior signed 20th rounder um, with the Padre system and pretty much pitched my way up to high A before I ran into a slap tear in my labrum Mm -hmm. at the age of 24, rehabbed it. Timing wise, just wasn't able really to get back at eight months post op uh, in spring training 2010. Got released and then had always really wanted to coach, uh, develop players, teach guys the lessons that it helped me be successful up, you know, throughout my career, try to try to get going and doing that. So at 25, about a month after I got released, I got hired to be the volunteer assistant coach here at UNC. My first game as a coach was actually in the postseason in the NCAA tournament 
in Norman, Oklahoma. This would have been Matt Harvey's draft year, 2010. So my first game as a coach was, you know, it was in that type of environment. It was awesome. I was hooked immediately. Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, we came we came short. We came up short there in that regional. But that was kind of the the beginning of my coaching journey. And I spent two full years at Carolina. Uh, we got to play in the College World Series in '11 with a really really great team with Colin Moran and um, Ken Emanuel, Patrick Johnson, Jacob Stallings, um, just a bunch of really high caliber player. Um, actually a coach that I, one of the guys I coach with now, Jesse Weirs Bicky, he was on that team. Cool. Um, 2012, uh, we lost in a regional, so a really good St. John's team. And then from there, I went and coached in the summer in Cape Cod with Kelly Nicholson, manager of the Orleans Firebirds, um, special human. And anybody that's listening who knows him knows what I'm talking about. Um, he's another great mentor of mine and got hired to join Mark Scaff's coaching staff at UNC Wilmington, coached alongside Randy Hood and Robbie Monday, two of my really good friends in coaching. We were there, it was there in 2013. We um, had a special team, went to a regional, won the CAA, and just as a young, ambitious coach, was anxious to get back to the ACC and was very fortunate that uh, Virginia Tech's um, new head coach, Pat Mason, called me and um, asked me to be his pitching coach. Um, so I went I went to Virginia Tech for three years. Um, coach there um, was really, really just learned some very, very valuable lessons uh, to make me better and build some special relationships, certainly with players and coaches there. And after three years there, after coaching at Virginia Tech in 14, 15, and 16, got the phone call from Coach Fox to to come back to Carolina and be the pitching coach here. And so I've been fortunate to be able to come back here in 2017 and 18 uh, as the pitching coach and coming into 2019 now um, in my third year. So um, in terms of my journey and kind of my path, that's that's kind of where I've gotten to today. Definitely. And I love that. And it, you've basically come full circle since your since your college years and I think that that's that's awesome I guess you're almost a UNC lifer but let's uh let's go ahead and talk about you know how you guys are developing your players and you know in particularly your pitchers and I know that you guys are on the forefront of the analytics stuff which we'll get into here in just a minute but let's just go ahead and, and hop right into the fall and you know with you guys having such limited time restrictions how do you get the most out of the fall and <clears throat> You know, depending on the month, I'm sure. But what does a typical week look like for you guys when you're able to get your hands on your players? Sure. Yeah. No. It's uh, it's definitely a crash course uh, with with limited time in the fall. Um, I'd say probably one of the most important parts of development occurs in the summer for us. With our all of our incoming players come to summer school for five weeks, and they take two classes to get ahead academically and get kind of um, incorporated into you know, what it takes to be a successful student. But while they're doing that, they're able to um, train with our strength staff. So, you know, all these players who are just graduating high school or transferring from a junior college for five weeks, they get to, they get to um, stay in a dorm here on campus. You get to come to our stadium. Um, we have a catered breakfast for them from our nutritionist. Then they go to class together. Then they come back to the stadium. They have a catered lunch from our nutritionist and our, and our brand new team's dining facility. Um, in our stadium and then they they change up and they head over and they train with our strength and staff just whether it's straight uh, strength speed conditioning etc and then uh, per NCAA rules we can't we can't do any baseball activities with them so you know they they kind of do whatever they need to do on the baseball side after that Um, they start preparing for but that prepares them for the fall Um, so then once we get into the fall all of our players come in they all get assessed um, by our training staff and our strength staff just in terms of just their functional movement, strength, uh, mobility, um, any, any, any potential risks or threats so that, that, that they could come across um, mm-hmm. just health-wise. And then we can address those things. Um, and, and again, just um, identify any weaknesses they may have that we need to kind of attack either on the training side or the strength side and their programming and what they're doing. Um, that's kind of early on. And then once, once we kind of get through that process, we get into skill work uh, for about two weeks or so, and guys are built up to throw bullpens, and position guys are 
are doing, you know, the fundamentals and skill work and learning. We're all like all of our players are learning the signs and the system and the routines. Um, we're just really big on here and, um, kind of that two week crash course, um, prepares our guys to jump right into scrimmages, which is where, you know, it's, it's a competitive environment. Um, we'll scrimmage about three to four days a week. Typically our pitchers have kind of one compete day and one training day, Mm -hmm. essentially a bullpen and then pitching one scrimmages. So that way over the course of the fall, we can kindly, you know, really kind of train and then put it to the test and then see how it performs and repeat, you know, rinse and repeat for, you know, six or seven weeks. So our fall pretty much, our full team practice, six days on one day off runs from usually September 1st to around October 13th or 15th. Um, like I said, we're scrimmaging four days a week. We're practicing two to three days a week and we have one day off for the guys. So that's kind of a typical fall. And then that once we get into post fall is where we are now, that's where we start to split up pitchers in terms of guys who were guys who pitched who threw live will assess kind of where they are in their development, what they need, you know, whether it's rest, more rest and recovery, maybe it's more, you know, it could be, um, velocity training, it could be delivery work, it could be different skill sets. Um, so we really sit down with each pitcher and try to um, kind of group guys into what they really need for the next five or six weeks on that end. Then pitchers who were shut down in the fall, they're obviously building back up. So, you know, because there's a group of those guys, right, that have sure. high volume in the fall and or in the spring and the summer who didn't pitch in the, in the, in the fall. So there's, you know, there's, They've been tra- they've been training different um, than all than everyone else, obviously, and then you know so it's working with them, and then you know we're kind of getting into where we are now, which is six weeks post fall. Our pitchers start to begin the process of rebuilding back up, you know, with both ply you know plyos training and throwing to build up to you know bullpens post after Christmas to be ready to come back in the fall and pre- or in the preseason and compete. I love it now. Something that that I have a really hard time with, or I did as a pitching coach, was when to shut guys down, or you know, kind of the the categories that you're talking about, which you know you're trying to have an individualized plan for each each person. So, without uh, without really drawing any hard lines, are there any things that you say, okay, if a pitcher throws over this amount of innings, or if this pitcher has this workload, we're going to shut them down versus uh, anything. I mean, does that make sense? So what, what are you looking sure. for when, when you decide to shut guys down versus when you decide to let them roll throughout the fall? Yeah, I think one of the things you said was just what you said, uh, didn't really, don't really draw any hard lines. Um, I think, I think keeping an open mind and communicating with each pitcher in terms of how he's feeling and you know, what his, cause I think players know themselves really well to a degree. So I think communicating with each pitcher in terms of what his vision for his personal process is. And then obviously, you know, as a coach communicating, you know, your vision and then kind of meshing the two together, um, I think is important because the player needs to have ownership and belief in what he's doing. I think that's really important. So, um, yeah. So like I'll sit down with each guy, um, I guess for, if I can break it down into its simplest terms, I try to look at, kind of the calendar year in the different categories in terms of the the spring season, the summer season and the fall season. And, you know, look at each guy in terms of, has he had a, has he had a heavy medium to light or even off workload? And usually for me, if a guy has had a heavy, a heavy workload in either, in either the spring or the summer, he's either, he's usually going to be limited or off in the fall. You know, if we've got if we've got a pitchers who've had a moderate work moderate workload in the spring and a moderate workload in the summer, um, then they're probably going to be limited or full go in the in the fall. If a pitcher, you know, has had a light spring and a moderate amount in the summer, um, then he'll probably be full go in the fall. Um, so there's not really that's try to how that's really how I try to look at it. Obviously, if a pitcher's had heavy workload in both the the spring and the summer, then um, you know, he's going to be limited to off in the fall in terms of competition. Um, so, but that's, that's in terms of 
simply trying to break it down simply. That's that's typically how I look at it. Cool. I really like that a lot. And and so, you know, obviously you talked about those guys competing in the fall, like actual scrimmaging, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, against live hitters. Mm-hmm. But is, it, is there any other ways sure. that you guys compete just from a ranking standpoint or just game stand, like not like actual game play, but just side games or anything like that that you guys post in a locker room? So uh, just to get a little bit better understanding of my question. So for hitters right now, we're doing average exit velo. Uh, average gains and peak and then we're posting those in the locker room so they can kind of see where they're at from week to week and then whenever i was a pitching coach we would chart like hit spot percentage strike percentage peak and average velocity and gains and different things like that just to post them so they could see and they were not only just competing with other guys trying to see you know on their matched up bullpens if they won or not but they're also competing with themselves to see from week to week what their progressions are so is there anything that you guys measure sure. like that that uh, that you get them to compete <clears throat> against each other with? Sure. Um, you know, probably from a data statistical standpoint, um, I'd say one of the best things that that we probably have incorporated is, um, and again, this is all the credit goes to Micah Daly Harris. Um, he's our sort of baseball data coordinator, I guess you could call him, slash undergrad student. Uh, but um, but he's you know he's been with us for three years and and he's assembled um, a really really talented group of students that just by their pure passion for you know being Carolina students and wanting to help um, I've kind of brought them on in a student managerial role and they've um, they've built what's called a like a data dashboard where essentially our guys can go on their phones um, or their computers and each player has his own individual profile. So after a game, he can go in and he can click on his own post uh, post game report, and essentially, you know, many of the numbers that you you talked about um, are there. Um, so our our players are able to see, you know, their performance and their measurables there. They can also see their practice reports, um, just from you know Rap Soto or any TrackMan data we're running during practice. They can they can look there. You know, just in terms of individual, they, you know, they're constantly being assessed and and what their performance quantified, so they can see sort of the trajectory of in which they're going in one way or the other. Whether again, whether it's you know strike percentage of a certain pitch type or in certain count or uh, average velocity, peak velocity, pitch movement. You know, is there is there movement? On certain pitches, is it is it increasing in a in a positive direction? Is it decreasing in a in a negative direction, or the or vice versa? Um, you know, they have they have the capability of of seeing this on their data dashboard. You know, the, the after a game is over, so that's probably from a statistical standpoint, um, that's probably where they look the most. But then they can they also have the ability to look at other guys' profiles, so they can compare, you know, their their numbers with other guys on the team's numbers. That's kind of, you know, probably the best way I can say that they get that. From a competition standpoint, one of the things that I think is really prevalent uh, here at Carolina is the environment itself is competitive. I don't think we have to create it. Um, I think that um, over, um, and it's a, it's a credit to Coach Fox and the coaches that have been here for a long time and and the players that have. Um, that come before our current players creating that environment to where they're constantly competing against each other every day. Um, they know that there's a, there's a sense of that. And I think that's the driving force that makes, that makes everyone better. I've heard you know, multiple guys talk about how they came to Carolina because they wanted to play in the ACC, but what they found that, you know, pitching next to, J.B. Bukowskis or Alex White Mm -hmm. or Matt Harvey, that's what made them better. It's not, it wasn't pitching against other teams in the ACC or the teams that you see us play in Omaha that makes us better. It's the daily process of competing against the best of the best that ultimately, you know, makes guys better. So just the environment itself is competitive. Post fall, I think we do some really neat things. In terms of like our, our fall world series, we put miles on the line. That's kind of 
been a tradition of ours. So like we have a best of three or a best of five series, depending on the year, like most teams do around the country. And the winning team has to run five miles and the losing team has to run 10 miles. So, you know, you can imagine there's a big difference between a five mile and a 10 mile run. Uh But the neat thing is, you know, if that, that series occurs in the middle of October for the next six or seven weeks, our players do a ton of competitions each week that can either add or subtract miles to their individual, you know, run, Mm -hmm. um, which is coming up here in a couple of weeks. So we do, you know, we'll do different, different team activities. We'll, We'll compete in different things, whether it's, you know, one day a week, we do a fun activity, um, where miles are on the line. Um, we do community service where miles are on the line, that stuff like that. So you'd be amazed at how much that (laughs) guys trying to work their miles down will, uh, make guys compete. So, um, and that's kind of been a tradition here. We've done that for a long time and I've done the 10 mile run two or three times and it's a beast because as you can imagine, uh, Chapel Hill is not a very flat place to run. Mm-hmm. So it's a good challenge, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, I'd say those are everything our guys are doing just in the weight room and in the bullpen and in scrimmages, you know, it's all being, it's all being measured and quantified and guys get that daily feedback. Uh, via the data dashboard that Mike and his team created to really assess their their performance and what they need to get better at and or what they need to continue to doing that's helping them be successful. For sure. And, you know, I, I read the Sabermetrics article that you guys were featured in, I think, this spring, and it's phenomenal. I'll make sure and link that down in the show notes because it's one of my <laughs> favorite reads that I've that I've read and just the story behind how you guys uh, have that team and it's it's very very forward thinking but i want to dig into a Thanks. little bit of of course i want to dig into a little bit of the culture that you guys have and and it's really interesting because you were a player there you went away and then you sure. came back so talk to us about you know sure. the culture that you guys are consistently trying to build and you've talked about being a competitive culture all the time but besides like the the 10 to 5 mile run and constantly like tacking that down i guess what uh, what are some other ways that you guys try and you know build your leadership, build your team, and then build your culture? Yeah, we 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 trust our guys. I think that's one of the the biggest things in terms of you know some some you know having you know gone other places just in general, not 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 necessarily previous places of coaching or anything like that, but just you know we all see things, um, been to different places, and we just really trust our players. And we instill a lot of, and what that means is when we instill trust in our players, you know, we give them a lot of leeway in terms of policing themselves and maintaining our team standards and maintaining that culture that's been built here by, you know, players that have played here for decades before them, you know, because we just, we think that's really important. If, if the, the, the lead the leadership, it's, I mean, it certainly starts with us and our coaching staff in terms of um, our direction and the things that we do and the things that we say and how we carry ourselves. But ultimately, the, um, trusting our players and recruiting the right players, you know, the guys that are capable of, of thriving in this culture um, is important. I mean, coach, coach has high, high standards and we're very upfront with with recruits on the front end that come in here and visit here, just in terms of, you know, you've, you've got to, it takes a person of, of high character to thrive here. You've got to love competition. Um, you've got to be confident. Um, you know, you've got to have all these things to be successful here. So we try to really identify those things on the front end and recruit as much of those things on the front end to where once they're here, we trust them to, you know, to have those things and then certainly develop them. I guess that's essentially how we do it here. Oh, definitely. I love that. And uh, if you guys do it on the front end, you get to do the fun stuff on the back end. So I think that's awesome. And and again, that's, uh, that's fantastic. But talk to us about some of the kids that you guys are looking for. So I'm a high school coach. I think the listeners know that and, and you know that as well. But I'm constantly trying to get my guys better just to hopefully send them off to colleges like you. But so what, uh, what are some of the most common problems that you see with the kids coming in? So let's say incoming freshmen 
And then, you know, how can we as high school coaches do a better job of helping prevent those problems so you don't have to even mess with them at all? Yeah, I mean, certainly things like time management are important for for most kids uh, coming up to the college level. Mom, dad, their caretakers, whoever it may be, coaches, they're, you know, they're, they take them to and from places. They kind of dictate their entire schedules, you know, when they're coming and going places and even, you know, what, what they are and aren't eating. Um, so just players taking on more responsibility for themselves, kind of having, developing a sense of independence. And then, like I mentioned, time management, the more a player can be developed in kind of those aspects, I think a player will be more prepared to come to uh, certainly Carolina, but, but, you know, any, anywhere in any baseball program in general throughout the country, I think at, at the next level, just because it's just, it's that important. So I think that's, that's one thing I think in general too, a lot of, a lot of guys haven't really learned to fail. Most players when they, by the time they get to the next level, if, you know, if, if high school is a level and then college, whether it's division one, two, three, NAIA or GCO, et cetera. I mean, whenever a player gets to another level, they've, they've been recruited to that level and they've been recruited to that level because they've likely had some level of success. So I think players that, um, that look at failure as an opportunity to grow. Um, and they look at challenges that are, are another op- or opportunity to grow and are open to trying you know, new things as opposed to just getting somewhere and being stuck in what they know. Uh, I think these, I think these are the types of things from a mindset standpoint, that guys that I see that are the most successful have the ability to do. So because you because every player is going to fail or, or be challenged um, at some point in their career, if not the high school level, certainly the college level and beyond. And you have to, you have to be equipped to, uh, to handle it sure. and embrace it. Sure. I love that. And, and it's something that, that I'm, I'm trying to do a better job myself of just failing more often and, and learning from it because, you know, I, my parents did the same thing. I, you know, I come from a middle-class family and, and I love them to death, but I think most middle-class <laughs> families feel like they can do a pretty good job of controlling outcomes. And so I think my parents sure. did, did a pretty good job of that. But at the same time, I think we see a lot of parents who try to try and do too much and, and hopefully myself someday because i i have a son who's two months old now i can kind of stay out of it and and let them let them grow from that on their own but talk to us about something that is really interesting that i really really like that you guys do and that's messing with timing and you know i've seen you post some videos and and for those who are like what what is he talking about just think of marcus stroman okay and i know that that he's a rival of y'all's at over at duke but uh, talk to us about how you guys (laughs) talk to us about how you guys train that and do you train it, or is it just something that your guys come to you and they're like, "Hey, I just want to give this a shot," or, or uh, just walk us through that? Yeah, no. It, um, so essentially, I look at every pitcher as has checkpoints in his delivery. I call those checkpoints one, two, three, four, or five, or A, B, C, D, and E. And you know, if if checkpoint A is taking the, is how you dress the rubber, taking the sign. Checkpoint B is your rocker step and pivot. And then checkpoint C is your leg lift and balance. And then checkpoint D is hand separation and, you know, driving towards the plate. E is extension and follow through, whichever terminology you want to use for those checkpoints is fine. But that's kind of how, when I, when I, when I start to teach a pitcher, you know, to disrupt timing, that's kind of where I begin is, is having each pitcher understand where their checkpoints are on the delivery now their normal delivery, their natural delivery that they're comfortable with, that they, you know, they're doing on a daily basis, you know, and then we kind of go from there in terms of identifying pitchers that we do or don't teach timing with. I try to teach the concepts to each pitcher, Mm -hmm. have them understand it. And then honestly kind of watch and see how they handle it. Some guys will surprise you. Some guys you think that aren't ready for it are actually incredibly ready for it. And then some guys that you think, this will come really neat, natural and easy to them. Um, it doesn't. So I try to teach it to each guy. And then as a pitching coach, you know, I know what each guy on a daily basis, you know, looks like and how he moves and that sort of thing. So if I like the direction that it's going, then 
continue to allow it. If I'm, if I feel like it's getting in the way of them in any, in any capacity, then certainly as a coach, I would kind of interject. So, but I try to, I try to teach the concepts because even if guys don't physically, you know, alter their delivery or tempo, there's still lessons to be learned in terms of why you would do it and, you know, why it could help you with, you know, understanding what the hitter is trying to do and what the hitter looks like when he's on time and what the hitter looks like when he's not on time and why that's important. Um, so I try to teach the concept to each pitcher. Um, and like I said, get that, you know, when I, when I do, when I do teach it to them, start to break it down to their deliveries and A, B, C, D, and E, or one, two, three, four, five, and try to, once we do get into teaching it to the guys, um, I think it's really important that guys, you know, start the book in chapter one. And a lot of times uh, pitchers are going to want to, you know, they'll see Stroman or Cueto or mm-hmm. whoever it may be. There's a young pitcher with the Rangers, Hans Kraus. You know, it's kind of all over the games now, but the guys who are doing things that, you know, what I would call chapter 10 or chapter 11 in the book in terms of just being really high level, far along in their development type stuff. And that's what they want to immediately jump in and do. And that's what you have to guard against. So chapter one for me is just picking out one, one aspect of your delivery that you feel really comfortable in. Typically it's a rocker step Mm -hmm. and just hold the rocker step for, you know, for longer than you normally would or skip it or abbreviate it, whatever it may be, but just pick that one aspect of your delivery and then have um, the ability to alter it. And for me, when any part of your delivery that you slow up, we call that putting a change up on a pitch mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, essentially you're trying to get the hitter to be anxious or out front. If we speed up or skip a step of a pitcher's delivery, we call that putting a fastball on a pitch. You could be throwing a slider, but if you go a rocker step pivot and then you go straight into hand separation and leg, and leg drive to the plate, um, then you're, you skip balance you've essentially forced the hitter to get his foot down early or start, start the timing, the sequential timing of his, of his swing earlier as if he's having to gear up for a fastball um, sooner. So we call that putting a fastball on a slider. Okay. Once, once pitchers really master, you know, one of the basics, um, they usually try to move on to another one. Um, you know, it could be balancing just, balance at C or three for a little bit longer in the windup with nobody on base. And you've got, um, you know, that's, that's a little bit more advanced. So now you're getting into like chapters two and three of the book, you know, and then once you master that and what it feels like to each pitch to both sides of the plate, you can move on to a double leg lift. And that's when you're, you know, like Austin Bergner for us. So he'll, uh, he's got a double leg lift to where, He'll, he'll go lift into C and then he'll go back down and then he'll go back up to C again. But that's chapter eight or nine of the book. And he's worked really hard to get there. And another, another aspect of that is too, it's not something that you necessarily need to do from the first pitch of the game on. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, we look at it as a tool. It's a tool that, or a weapon that you can have um, in your arsenal that you know, if you're cru- if you're cruising with your normal delivery throughout the course of the game and you're throwing six shutout, you know, there's there's no need to go grab that weapon. You don't need it. The weapons you're using are sufficient. But you might get into a situation in the fifth or the sixth, third time through the order, where they might be on your stuff a little bit. Now you can pull this weapon out of your bag and it can get you to the get you through the sixth and into the seventh, or it can get that. Um, middle of the order hitter out with runners in scoring position, whatever it may be. So we don't look at it like something that you have to do all the time. It's something that just, it's just an aspect of pitching that I want guys to understand. And again, just so that, I mean, the more weapons you can have as a pitcher to get hitters out, I think the more chance you have of surviving and being successful. Right. And so I'm just thinking to myself that, if there are some some listeners out there and you know us included if we've got guys who are good athletes who are 75 to 82 which is kind of your average high school pitcher do you think this would be really useful mm-hmm. for them to to try this and just to i mean the end, at the end of the day we we've, we've got to get hitters out so would this be something that you would right. suggest for them 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, if nothing else, you can try it and it fails Mm -hmm. and, you know, scratch it. You can try it and fail, but now you have a better understanding of, of reading hitters and recognizing, Hey, this guy, you know, this guy's a leg kick guy. I can use it only against those guys or whatever it may be. You just starts to kind of allow pitchers to see the game a little bit at a higher level. So it's just, it can, at least if nothing else, it can be educational. Oh, I love it. And you know, I, we, my dad always used to say, you know, hitting is timing and pitching is trying to disrupt that timing. So I think that, uh, that mm-hmm. if this sounds interesting for you, give it a shot and give your kids some ownership for it. And at, at the end, I, I think that it would at least, it would make their ears perk up a little bit, which would draw some interest to them because they're like, Oh, this is kind of cool. You know, I guess, cause with, with hitters, you're like, Hey, try leg kick today. They're like, Oh man, well, with pitchers, you're like, Hey, throw it hard. That's awesome. But let's try and mess with some timing. Right. I'm all in. So I love yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Just, it's, it's just another, it's just another weapon that guys can go to and the battle of getting hitters out. For sure. Well, let's go ahead and skip to the spring and, and, you know, we're getting there uh, faster than I can even imagine, but uh, let's take a Friday starter or just any day of the week starter for you. And if you don't mind, just kind of run through what your, you know, recovery program looks like. I know that, that a lot of the questions that we have for the podcast are, what do we do with pitchers in between starts? And uh, obviously that depends on, you know, the workload and how they feel and, and all of these different things, but if you had to, you know, give us an outline of a, of a program that we could take tomorrow and use for our staff, uh, do you mind walking us through a little bit of, of of that? Sure. You're talking about more like just like a typical college pitch, starting pitcher routine, um, right? Right. Pre, post throw, that type of thing. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, we're we're huge on routines. Um, so for me, uh, just I can only speak on our pitchers here at Carolina we try to individualize each guy's program as much as we can to, to his needs. So we have pitchers, we have starting pitchers. We'll just talk about starters for, for right now. You know, we have starters that will, some of them will, will prefer to bullpen on day four. Some of them prefer to bullpen on day five. Some of them prefer to throw a short pin on day three and day five. So for me, it's just really establishing as early as possible is, uh, which, you know, what is each pitcher's best individual routine? Mm-hmm. Um, and then once we, once we have kind of like that bullpen day locked down, everything goes from there because that'll, that'll kind of dictate what we're doing from a drive line, uh, plyo or over weighted ball protocol, um, a throwing, a weekly throwing routine, our lift routine, our conditioning routine, emphasis that we put on nutrition arm care recovery, flexibility, mobility, core work, uh, mental preparation, skill work, and those types of things. I mean, those are, we, I, I run through those fast, but those, that's what we look at as our, our pitcher's process. So, and then, and every day looks a little bit different. So for, for example, like a pitcher, for us, a pitcher's compete day, he has an, he has a game day routine of, you know, what time he gets to the yard what music he listens to, what he eats, when he starts, you know, when he starts to go to the weight room, um, or wherever it may be to, you know, to get, to begin his activation routine, what time he walks out of the dugout down to the left field, you know, down to the bullpen, um, to begin his routine there to goes into his pregame throwing session, which will be the same routine every single time that he goes to make a start pretty much down to the throw and the distance again, not necessarily scripted, but it is, it is ironed out and um, they each know it to what time they get into the bullpen to their sequences in the bullpen of, you know, progressions, whether it's, you know, establishing the fastball, their primary off-speed pitch, and then their, maybe their, you know, their their secondary off-speed pitches and certain sides of the plate might finish with simulating hitters, counts, et cetera. And then what time they walk into sit down in the dugout, get a drink of water, gather their thoughts, concentrate on their breathing, and then go to take the mound. So I tried to run through that really fast, but that's, those are the type of things that we really value in terms of like a pregame routine for a starting pitcher. Cool. Yeah. We'll compete throughout the course of the day. And then um, as soon as their outing is over, we'll go in 
and we start preparing for our next outing. That's how we look. As soon as, as soon as our pitcher's outing is done, the clock for us, the clock starts on preparing for that next start or that next appearance to an opportunity to help our team win. So um, typically our guys go into the weight room and yeah, we go, we go through a lot of um, driveline protocols in terms of their recovery methods and um, arm care, certain level of conditioning. Mm -hmm. You guys run. And then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like typically, like typically we go through um, 10 minute uh, continuous. So, some guys prefer the treadmill. Some guys prefer the bike. Some guys, but yeah, like we'll we'll go through um, mostly. But it's a it's a ton of you know up like pl- upward tosses with the plyos, um, rebounders, band pull aparts, no monies, mm-hmm. um, those types of things. Uh, shoulder blade, body tube, Jager band, kind of back of the shoulder stuff. The cross ball rollout for soft tissue. Got a Mark Pro. Um, if we have access to that, we can use that. Mm-hmm. Um, so just very various, various things that we feel kind of jumpstart the recovery process. We have hydrotherapy here at our stadium, cold hot tubs that guys can can jump into um, as well. But like I said, so everything kind of for the rest of the week, the next in college six days gears towards around which days or day they're going to bullpen, mm-hmm. and that affects their lifting schedule. So for typically, just to run through it, our our starting pitchers heavy lower emphasis lift is going to be. Uh, the day after he starts and then we're going to the day of his bullpen, we'll have another leg circuit day. And then the day after his bullpen, we'll have a total body day. You know, we typically in season limit the amount of upper body workload that we put on our pitchers in the weight room. Doesn't mean, you know, obviously we, obviously we have movements and lifts for that, but you know, we're not, we're not doing too, too much on the strength side with our upper extremities in season outside of our plyo training, our driveline, our arm care routines, those types of things, you know, grip work, different things for that. So that's kind of a lift schedule. And then, yeah, just our conditioning schedule. We'll have a work capacity day on day two um, and day three. Um, And then we'll have a speed power choice, um, which again, this, this is just for us. It'll be posted for our guys. Um, we have work capacity days and we have speed days and we have agility days. And again, we, our guys just have different options for those that they kind of incorporate into their week. We're big on nutrition. So the day after our guys compete, um, we emphasize getting large meals and proteins, uh, protein into their system, emphasize getting three meals, two snacks each day. Mm-hmm. The day of a bullpen, our guys you know, we're, we're trying to get amino acids and omega threes for recovery days before, you know, before pens and before games, we're emphasizing, uh, sleep and hydration. So you know, again, this is just, this is just aspects of our process that we, we look at, you know, here at Carolina. So something that, you know, I, I thought I didn't do a very good job of early on in my career. And that's, I, I probably ran pitchers too much just because, you know, that's, it's kind of the culture of you get done running and you, you and we didn't run poles sure. or, you know, or, or miles and miles at a time, but we would do just sprint work and then we'd go to the weight room. And I just felt like, you know, it, it was by the end of the season, our guys were worn down a little bit from doing both, but Sure. What what's your best advice? And especially being a guy that, that did it at a high level. So you're right there with those guys. But should we sure sh- every day should we do some sort of conditioning or should we scale it back? Because I mean, obviously pitching's really hard on your body as it is, but I want to know what what do you think that you guys have found to be kind of that happy medium? Sure. Yeah, for us, I, I think without going too much into too much detail, I think it's important to look at your your season as break it split it up into um various phases so for us like we play a 15 week regular season split that up into if phase one is five weeks phase two is the middle five weeks and then phase three is the last five weeks we typically taper down so as you can imagine our winter and preseason training is pretty intense because we're not competing yet so we're trying to get stronger and more mobile and faster, you know, develop athleticism um, as much as possible in that phase. And then once you get into that first phase, you begin kind of tapering things down and then 
once you get the second phase, you taper down again, and then you get to the third phase, the back five weeks of the season, you taper down again. Um, just because like you said, over the course of the season, there's going to be natural wear and tear and it can, it can be harder for guys to recover. Mm-hmm. So I think you certainly need to be mindful of, of that. And for us, that's how we try to really break it down is we, we phase, we phase every aspect of the year, our strength and conditioning staff, coach, uh, Greg Gatz uh, is our coordinator and he does a phenomenal job in terms of sort of regulating that. Um, but that's how we at Carolina try to look at is, is like you said, we try to, we try to taper down as the season goes and breaking our year, our season into phases. Oh, awesome. And, you know, I, I asked this question because it's something that, that I've struggled with as well. And so how do we develop command and how do we develop even just control first and then command? And are there any practical ways that you guys uh, do that rather than just playing catch with some intent? It's a great question. You, uh, you recruit command. That's how, <laughs> that's how you develop it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, kind of. but no, I mean, it, it's, yeah, sort of, it's a, like you said, I mean, it's, it's a daily mindset. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is, a, it's a daily mindset. Um, I mean, our pitchers, when they throw they, they you know, every single throwing session, our guys have, whether it's, uh, you know, targets to the, to the glove or it's checkpoints on the body. Um, our guys are constantly, are constantly throwing or to, with the mindset that they're attempting to narrow their focus, right? Like, don't look at the center of the mitt. You look at the lace, look at the, the lace hanging off the bottom of the catcher's mitt. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm talking in terms of narrowing the focus. Mm-hmm. So our guys, our guys throw with that mindset on a daily basis have begun to implement, uh, to a degree with some, with some of our pitchers, uh, some over and under load training, uh, with weighted baseballs kind of can really help enhance the feel of the release point and challenge, you know, the repeatability of that with, um, integrating four or five and six, six ounce throwing ball, uh, baseballs into, uh, that training. Again, a lot of those protocols stem from, um, what the guys at driveline are doing in Seattle. Sure. So we, we we've, um, we've used those to a degree with some guys, um, and had some good, uh, responses and feedback and, success so far. So, um, that's something that we've implemented as well, but yeah. And then just, um, initially here without going too long, that's, those are probably things that I think it, you know, is where a good place to start. I love it. And you know, it's, it's something that we talk about in little league and it's something that we're constantly harping on in high school, college, and I'm sure pro ball as well. And, you know, another aspect of, I, I was a catcher growing up, so I, I didn't pitch a whole lot. And the, you know, I, so I've always been curious of what people say on a mound visit or, you know, guys like yourself, <laughs> what do you guys say on a mound visit? And so can you, uh, it probably depends on the person, but di- uh, go, go into that sure. a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, it just really depends on the situation. It dep- it can depend on the pitcher. I'd, I'd say, um, I honestly, I, I try to, I try to never take a mound visit unless I know with certainty I have one nugget or <laughs> certain thing that you know I'm I know that I can bring to the pitcher or to the you know to the players on the field. You know, so that's that's important. Um but yeah I mean you can it can be different things. You can be uh reminding a guy that there might be a pinch hitter that's coming up and you might need to run through a short scouting report on the hitter. It could be uh just a reminder of a bunt defense or a pickoff play. It could be some form of a positive affirmation for a guy uh, that you can tell that just really needs to get to a, a more positive place, help him visualize a positive outcome. Um, it could be could be a lot of different things, really. Um, usually, it's it's usually it's some form of short term adjustment or a focal point or you know something positive for the pitcher to to take away, um, and help him get out of that situation. Usually it's not mechanical, um, unless it's a pitcher that has, has shown the ability to, you know, something that you've worked on with a pitcher, there might be an external cue, um, that he's really has shown the ability to, to respond well to that's probably as, as much in the mechanics as I'll get in a mound visit as an external cue, but it's typically, it's typically all of those things, you know, or one, one of those things. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for sharing. And again, I'm always curious to see, because 
you you don't know what other coaches are saying up on a mound because you can't hear them. So I'm I I love that, and, and I think that, that that's fantastic. But let's go into your personal growth a little bit, and I'm sure it's you know it's it's you've grown a lot since you've played. But talk to us about, and I say that because I know I have. I thought I knew the game, and then I got done and got into coaching, and I realized that I didn't yeah. even scratch the surface of what I needed to know. But talk to us about some changes sure. that you guys were, were making from last year to this year. And again, you're a lifelong learner, and I'm sure that, that we could spend an entire podcast on this. But what are some things that you guys sure. did last year that you were like, eh, we can do it a little bit better, and now that you're doing this year? Yeah, so we're in the process of, of upgrading the video system in our, um, you know, in our bullpen, uh, we're looking, we're, we're trying, we're looking to add some high speed cameras with some slow mo software and, uh, an outdoor, uh, TV so that our guys can get, uh, like get replay on their, their pitches. Um, that's something that's kind of, that's something we're in the works of, of doing now. Yeah. Just, just constantly trying to refine, guys training a little bit smarter. So we we've broken guys up into more specialized groups in terms of trying to, you know, get them to accomplish something more specific. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just, I wouldn't say, you know, much more than much more than that. I wouldn't say there's, there's too much ground. There's nothing really groundbreaking or revolutionary really to share. I gotcha. Well, what about your own personal learning? Is there anything that that you've learned lately that's gotten you really excited that you're like, man, this in the pitching delivery or this on recovery or, or this or that, that you're like, man, I need to dig into this more. And it, and it's, uh, again, like, like I said earlier, it's gotten you really excited. Yeah. And I mean, just everything with the high speed, high speed cameras, being able to see the ball come off, come off the pitcher's fingers and starting to understand, you know, what the cause and the effect of that process, I guess. So in terms of, you know, trying to gain a better understanding of when a, when a, for example, a pitcher throws a good change up and you see the ball come off of, you know, his middle and ring finger, uh, would he actually benefit more of it only coming off of his, his middle finger, you know, trying to really get a better understanding of, you know, what that's, what that video is showing and what is the story is telling and how that can affect our players. That's probably the aspect that I'm, probably most excited about trying, you know, sinking my teeth into right now and really uh, pitch planning for guys, you know, based on their arsenals um, and what Micah and his team are telling me in terms of their uh, pitch value based on, you know, what their, you know, what their pitches are grading out as uh, velocity and movement um, wise, um, their ability to, to tunnel their pitches and, and just try to come up with, as, as good of a, a pitch plan for each pitcher as possible, you know, especially this winter going into the preseason. Um, that, that's, that's something that I'm, I'm excited about those types of things. Very cool. And I've got two more questions for you before we let you go. And I, again, I'm so thankful that I've, that I've gotten to have you on the mic and you've given us a ton of good information, <laughs> but I want to know what's something that you guys do in practice, whether it be a competition or just some fun game or just anything that you guys do that your players love and they just get really excited whenever you guys do it. <laughs> you know, again, it's probably nothing that's too revolutionary that, you know, on other teams around the country is just, um, you know, as a coaching staff, we try to, we try to bring the same effort and energy and, attitude to the yard with us every day. So I, I just think it's, there's a certain level of consistency. The guys know what to expect when they get to the yard. We enjoy being around each other. We do have, I guess one thing I, I will say is we're as a pitching staff here, we're kind of big into music. So um, we have, we have a bow speaker that I'll bring, I'll bring to the bullpen. Most, uh, most days there's stretch. There's, there's, there's days where, you know, we need to throttle that down and, don't need it, but most more, most, most days we actually have, um, our pitchers will pick a Pandora station, which it can get really interesting, uh, clean music, obviously, but, uh, but we'll, we'll have, we have music going in the bullpen pretty much all the time, whether it's guys going through their pre throw activation routine, guys are going through some form of velocity training with the plyos in the bullpen, you know, we'll have it to a certain degree, uh, during throwing sessions, we'll pin with music during certain guys' bullpens, um, just kind of 
again, as there's, there's research in terms of music and helping pitchers get into a flow state, which is a whole nother conversation. So I'm just, I'm, I grew up, I grew up, uh, my brother's a musician. My parents love music. Um, music was a big part of my training and preparation as a player. So, um, I think our guys look forward to, you know, having some element of music going, you know, in the bullpen when, when they're there. Plus it's, plus it's, they, they, it's individualized to them too. Like I can tell sometimes what kind of, what kind of mood they're in based on <laughs> what, what station you go with. So sure. it makes every day a little bit different, which is cool. Definitely. I love that answer. Now, uh, again, before you go, can you kind of empty out your pockets to, uh, any resources or books or anything that's really shaped your coaching career and, uh, and share with us? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, really for me, I think, uh, ahead of the curve by Brian Kenny, it's a phenomenal book. It covers a wide range of covers, a wide range of the game and where it's going and things that you know, should, you should be kind of looking at. Travis Sawchick, Big Data Baseball, uh, sort of recaps the Pittsburgh Pirates and how they revamped their player development and in-game approach to uh, make it back to the playoffs, some things that they did. Yeah, there's I'm in the process of a lengthy read, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is a, um, you know, it's, it's a great read so far. So I'm a big audiobook guy. I think I think if coaches out there can can you know pick up Amazon Audible and download various books and instead of going music or phone calls on the ride you can go more more that route. Um since I since I started doing that a couple of years back I've I felt like that my growth as a coach is really developed. I love it. And so um, I'm a huge audiobook fan. I listen to Audible myself and so, uh, Robert, again, thank you so much for being with us today. And if any of our listeners would, would like to reach out, is there a way that we, they can get in touch with you and ask you some questions about um, today's show? Sure. Yeah. I mean, my Twitter handle is at rwoodard20, and um, you can shoot me a DM. And then my email address is rwoodard at unc.edu. Feel free to shoot me an email as well. Um, obviously for the high school players out there and high school parents out there, there's certain rules in terms of guys that can and can't respond to. Um, so if you're a 2021, 22, 23, 23 grad, um, that's going to be pretty limited. But, um, outside of that, um, those are the two ways for sure to, to get up with me. I love it. Well, I'm just going to open up the mic for you. And is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? I mean, one thing I, I, I do want to finish with is, is, the more, the more time I spend with our staff and our players and Brett and Micah is the more I realize that I have so much more to learn and it's exciting. And, um, I just, I'm hopeful that I never get to a place where that's not the case. Um, because you can, you really can never figure it all out. Thank you for listening to ahead of the curve. Before you go, I'd love to be able to get in touch with you, and we have several different ways of doing so. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at AOTC underscore podcast. You can join the AOTC Coaches Facebook group, and if you want to be a part of the mini clinic emails, both of those links are listed below. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a rating or review to help others find and stay ahead of the curve.